Good morning, everyone. Why don't we get started? Thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to be recording this, so it'll be uh, available to you uh, afterward as well. Um, not clear. Uh, we got some questions over email. A lot of people signed up for this. We'll see how many people sign up and uh, how long we go. Glenn and I have scheduled at least an hour, but could go as long as two hours. Uh, so um, uh, again, welcome. Um, before we start, I just want to run through a little bit um, of how the webinar technology works so you can um, ask your question. And uh, also, Glenn and I will briefly introduce ourselves, and then I'll give a uh, short overview of uh, the agenda of the programs that we teach. So if, uh, give you, it might prompt some questions on that front. And uh, then we'll open it up for um, any and all questions. So uh, let me uh, pull up uh, the slide presentation here. And let's uh, go through it. So uh, this Zoom webinar technology we're using, uh, it's outstanding, highly recommended. Um, so Glenn and I are the hosts and panelists. Uh, so our video's on at all times, unless we turn it off. Um, all of you are attendees, uh, are muted by default, um, uh, and neither we nor anyone else can see your video feeds. Uh, to ask a question, uh, there are two options. Uh, number one, click raise hand. Uh, and we'll see that you're raising your hand. Uh, we will promote you to panelists um, and uh, turn on your uh, audio and uh, if you have it, video. And uh, we and everyone else will be able to see you and go ahead and ask your question. Um, and then uh, after we're uh, finished discussing it, you're welcome to ask follow-up questions, et cetera. But when we move on to the next questioner, we'll just move you back to attendee. Um, if you don't have a video feed or would just uh, prefer uh, to remain uh, in the background, uh, you're welcome to ask your question. Someone's already posted um, a question on the chat. And just keep in mind there are two settings when you write on chat. One is all panelists and the other is all panelists and attendees. So if you want to ask a, a question that everyone else can see, do all panelists and attendees. If you want only Glenn and me to be able to see it, just uh, select all panelists um, and we will uh, uh, we won't use your name, uh, for example, if you want to ask a question confidentially. So, uh, Glenn, why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and then I'll do the same. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, I grew up in West Orange, New Jersey. Um, I spent uh, my, my whole life growing up in the, uh, in the same home. Um, I went to, uh, to college in New Jersey at Princeton. I was an electrical engineering and computer science major uh, down there uh, at a time when electrical engineering and computer science meant something different than I think they mean today, but uh, pretty good background anyway. Um, after that, I went to um, Wharton Business School and I got my MBA. Uh, since the time I was very, very young, um, I wanted to work with my dad in his company. He had a company that manufactured cable television uh, equipment and it was called Blonder Tongue Laboratories. So since the time I was about 10 years old, I took every school break, every summer, um, and later on every year to work there in pretty much every division uh, the company had out manufacturing in the warehouse, um, in uh, marketing and engineering, in uh, general management. And uh, so that was my career path, my intended career path. And uh, in, uh, in 1987, he and his partner actually ended up selling the company. Uh, so I had to find a new job. Uh, for the first time in my life. And I went to Wall Street. I went to work at DLJ, Donaldson, Lufkin, Jen, and Red, which was a very aggressive um, investment bank at the time. It was um, prolific in the quantity of transactions that, uh, that the company went through. So I financed um, probably 15 to 20 deals uh, a year through my investment banking career and got to see a whole lot of companies um, and the interacting, in, in the, uh, the behind the scenes finances, and just how businesses worked in a wide, wide variety of industries. I was a generalist in the leverage finance group, uh, mostly doing LBOs. So um, at the um, tail end of the internet bubble, uh, DLJ asked me if I would uh, become the president of their online brokerage business, DLJ Direct. Uh, interestingly, DLJ had a brokerage division that it housed that in the public markets would be valued at more than the whole company was valued at. So uh, we were uh, attempting to unlock that value. So I became the president of that company, uh, went on a big road show, uh, it was a New York Stock Exchange listed business, and uh, very successful until the NASDAQ cracked. 
And when the NASDAQ cracked, DLJ sold itself. Uh, the acquirer of Credit Suisse did not want DLJ Direct, so we sold that business. Um, and at the time I was running uh, the company, uh, I got to know Whitney through his online writing. He's a, a very, very uh, active and intelligent writer, um, mostly through The Motley Fool. Um, and I contacted him and we got to know each other. Um, and I, I became passionate about, about investing about that time, about 20 years ago. So uh, as we became friends and as I was selling uh, DLJ Direct to someone else, I, I needed something else to do. Whitney's business was growing and I eventually joined uh, his firm. Um, at the time we renamed it Case, uh, we renamed it T2 Partners and we had a good run and then we had a, a less good run. Whitney will probably talk a little bit about that. And when we stopped managing money together, I ran um, uh, my own fund uh, for, for a couple of years. And uh, when Whitney started uh, this new business, uh, he and I had been teaching together ever since we've known each other. Uh, we're, I think we're both good at it. Uh, I know we both enjoy it. Uh, so this sounded like a really good opportunity to, uh, to get the band back together and um, to do stuff that we really enjoy. So my goals and ambitions of life are basically to continue doing um, what I'm doing now, which is wake up in the morning, uh, create my own schedule, um, plan my own day, uh, do what I like doing. In this particular case, I like work, I like teaching, I like learning, I like working with uh, smart people. Uh, Whitney is uh, at the top of the list for that, but the, uh, the students that we've had in these classes are absolutely terrific, and I've, I've really enjoyed uh, that, that process. You can see from this picture, I have five children. Um, my youngest is my daughter. Uh, she's uh, left high school this year and is going off to college in, uh, later this month, actually. So uh, a little bit of uh, uh, an empty nester from that perspective, um, but they're all doing well. Uh, none of them are in the finance uh, business. So that's my background. Great, uh, thank you, Glenn. Uh, let me uh, briefly introduce myself now. Um, so um, I, uh, I did not grow up in the same house <laughs> my entire childhood like Glenn did. In fact, uh, pretty much precisely the opposite. Um, my parents uh, were, according to family lore, uh, they uh, were the third couple to meet and marry in the Peace Corps in 1962. They met during Peace Corps training, got married in the Philippines. Uh, I came along uh, four years later after they left the Peace Corps, uh, but my parents uh, to this day have uh, stayed in the field of international development and um, uh, have retired in Kenya. So um, uh, let me uh, highlight a, a few of the pictures. So the first school I ever attended, uh, this picture in the upper left here, um, was in Morogoro, Tanzania, where my father was uh, training teachers at the Morogoro Teachers College. Um, I uh, was the only white kid in a school with um, uh, Tanzanian farmers' children, so naturally I wanted to be a farmer. So every day I would uh, come home, and uh, that's a hoe over my shoulders, and I would dig dirt in the yard. Um, uh, after uh, uh, then, we moved back to California, where my dad got his doctorate in education at Stanford. Um, and uh, the only noteworthy thing uh, that happened when I was there was. Uh, I was one of the 600 kids that they tested back in 1972. I was six years old in the famous marshmallow test. So uh, these pictures over here of this young guy, that is not me, um, but it shows the kid agonizing over whether to eat the marshmallow. It's one of the most famous uh, you know, social science uh, experiments of all time. Uh, they've been tracking all 600 of us now for 45 years and uh, some uh, pretty remarkable findings about kids who uh, resisted uh, eating the marshmallow, um, had some uh, uh, restraint uh, and uh, di uh, discipline, uh, self-restraint at, at that young age, had much better life outcomes. Uh, and so they never did, everyone always asked me, well, did you eat the marshmallow or not? And they never tell you, uh, it would ruin their experiment. So. Uh, after three years there, uh, we moved down to Nicaragua. Uh, my parents are avid horseback riders, so we had a horse in our backyard. That's my sister and me and my mom on the horse. Um, went back to Stanford for a year where my dad finished his doctorate and then moved out to Western Massachusetts. Uh, my dad took a job as academic dean of Northfield Mount Hermon School, uh, about two hours west of Boston, um, out in uh, Western Mass, um, where uh, I went to sixth grade, uh, then went to two years at Eagle Brook, um, a private school in Deerfield, Mass., and then went to Northfield Mount Hermon, which at the time was the largest private boarding school in the country. Uh, was lucky enough to get into Harvard, and uh, uh, at Harvard, uh, I met one of my oldest, dearest friends, uh, Bill Ackman. This over here is a picture of us, uh, sort of middle of college. 
Um, you can see that Bill did not yet have gray hair. Uh, we've been close friends for uh, 30 plus years ever since. Uh, upon graduation, uh, I had a job at uh, Boston Consulting Group waiting for me, but um, knew Wendy Kopp's brother, and he told me about uh, her plan to start this new organization called Teach for America. Uh, I thought she was a, uh, a great entrepreneur and had a great idea, so I deferred my job at BCG, went down to New York, and my first job out of college was being part of the original group of uh, five or six people who started Teach for America. Uh, I wasn't there for very long, can't take any credit for what TFA has become, but it was, a, it was a great experience and I've been involved with charter schools and education reform for about 30 years as well. So went back to Boston, had the only job of my life, the only real job I've ever had in my 30 years since business school, was two years as an associate at Boston Consulting Group. Uh, I was not much of a consultant, uh, but it was a great, great training experience. Um, and uh, Bill Ackman and I crashed the Harvard Law School booze cruise of Boston Harbor. Uh, where, where we met my wife, who uh, ends up went to Hebrew school with Bill when they were both kids out in Westchester. She recognized him, came on up. Um, I elbowed my way into the conversation, and uh, the rest is history. We like to joke that she married the wrong hedge fund manager. Uh, so that's a picture here of us on our wedding day uh, almost 25 years ago. Uh, still happily married, and as you can see from the last picture here on the lower left, uh, we have three beautiful daughters. Um, Allison's 22, she just graduated from Carleton College out in Minnesota, is coming back to New York, gonna live at home for a little bit, uh, is working in Ernst & Young Consulting. Our middle daughter, Emily, is 19, just finished her freshman year at Wake Forest, uh, which she loves. And our baby, Catherine, is 16 and is going into her junior year at Nightingale Bamford School here uh, in the city, which is where my wife works as well. Um, she uh, was a lawyer for 12 years, never really cared for it and now she's doing what she really loves working at our daughter's school so uh, i like glenn um, am in the entrepreneurial uh, business uh, launching a new business here case learning uh, actually getting back into the money management business uh, in the next uh, couple of months through a separately managed accounts uh, business that i'm setting up uh, uh, still in its early stages uh, but plan to continue teaching via case learning uh, staying independent doing things that i love so uh, let me now, uh, let's pivot uh, over to, uh, let me just quickly walk you through the agenda of the three programs that we teach. We do a three-day Lessons from the Trenches Investing Boot Camp. Um, it's three full days in person, or we just finished teaching it uh, the last two weeks over nine two-and-a-half-hour uh, webinar sessions, just like this one. Uh, so we uh, here's sort of the, the, the quick highlights. Uh, we start by teaching our story, the rise and fall of case learning uh, in two parts. The first part focusing on the investing lessons, how we put up good numbers over 12 years and then put up uh, market trailing numbers over the last seven years that ultimately led to me to decide to close the business last fall. Um, we dive right into how to achieve superior performance. Uh, everything we teach is case study oriented. So. Uh, we talk about two of our, our um, best investments over the years, Berkshire Hathaway and McDonald's. Um, then even as value guys, uh, we find value in growth sometimes and uh, finding companies that are showing accelerating growth is a good way to make money. So we teach Netflix, Google, and Facebook. Um, then we pivot over to avoiding value traps because doing well as an investor is both a function of picking good stocks that go up, but also avoiding value traps that can blow you up. Uh, we have uh, Valiant, uh, which is probably the biggest value trap in history, uh, and then a little small cap uh, value trap that we got caught in called Spark Networks. Uh, we have a little five company exercise. Uh, the, the second third of the program, uh, we come back to the rise and fall of Case Capital, um, teaching the business and entrepreneurship lessons and the many things we did right, and then the things we did to screw that up. Um, then uh, we talk about portfolio management, which is as important as good stock picking. Uh, how do you size positions? What do you do when a stock is running up? When do you trim it? When do you exit? And critically, what do you do when a stock is running against you? Uh, we've got a good case study there, SodaStream. Uh, then we uh, dive into uh, short selling and do a module on that, uh, a module on activism, looking at Canadian Pacific and CSX. Um, and then just uh, some interesting case studies, uh, a couple airlines and a car rental uh, company where we found value. Uh, then we do a behavioral finance exercise and come back the next day and go through it. Uh, really fascinating exercise. Um, it's absolutely critical to be a successful investor to understand 
uh, the emotional side of investing and how every human being's brain is hardwired to be irrational when it comes to money. Uh, so we have a whole module on that. Um, then uh, the last part of the boot camp, um, we go through a lot of stuff outside of investing, um, uh, sort of life lessons. Um, so we go through a book that I'm in the process of uh, finishing called Beyond Value Investing, Life Lessons from Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and me. Um, talk about how to cultivate mentors, uh, make friendships, uh, develop deep relationships. Um, we uh, have a long presentation on avoiding calamities, uh, the kind of stuff Charlie Munger's always talking about. Have a little module on raising money, how to make a good impression, strategies for winning the class participation game, how to deal with mistakes and apologize. Um, and so we, you know, we finish the module, um, the uh, boot camp on that. Uh, we also teach a one-day seminar or broken into three two-and-a-half-hour webinars on how to launch and build an investment fund. So this presumes that you're a good investor and, uh, and is very focused on the nitty-gritty practical aspects of starting your own business, starting with the decision to launch a fund and whether you should even go down that route. Uh, then we usually bring in our lawyer, Ron Geffner, to discuss uh, the legal uh, aspects of setting up a fund. Um, we also bring in a friend, Don Reed, who is our, um, our relationship at Goldman Sachs, our prime broker, um, who's the world expert on prime brokers and how do you pick and choose and negotiate with one. Um, and then we have a whole module on a lot of logistical questions. Should you set up a hedge fund or a separately managed accounts business? What kind of fee should you charge? Uh, redemption term should you set? Uh, who and when to hire people? Um, should you do a seed deal? Should you have a partner? So that's the first half of this uh, um, seminar. Then the second half assumes that you've now launched your business. And we're talking people who are generally bootstrapping a business. Maybe they got $5 million to start out. How do you make a name for yourself and build your business? Most importantly, how do you raise money? That is the single most important thing we teach in this seminar. Um, part of that is putting together a great investor pitch deck and we go through good and bad ones. Um, part of it is writing great investor letters. We go through many of those. Um, have a module on surviving poor performance, a uh, little, uh, little uh, slide presentation on uh, developing resilience and uh, how I uh, went out and let the Navy SEALs kick the crap out of me, um, which definitely helped me build resilience. Um, and then uh, lastly, you know, how do you create a great slide presentation, make a killer stock pitch? So the other seminar that we teach, we call an advanced seminar on short selling for people who really want to do a deep dive on that. So um, we do a much more in-depth uh, presentation uh, on lessons from 15 years of short selling. Um, we do uh, maybe a short one-hour piece on that as part of the boot camp. So this is a, a much deeper dive into that. Uh, then we start going through case studies, uh, lumber liquidators. Uh, usually we have a couple guest speakers over the course of the day. Um, when we have some of our own case studies uh, like Wingstop and Tesla, uh, and uh, then we usually ask our guest speakers as well as our participants to share their very best uh, ideas and case studies. So uh, the idea of this seminar is not only to really learn a lot about short selling, but also uh, to walk out of there with a bunch of good, actionable, current short ideas. So uh, with that, um, let me just suggest uh, if you um, if you if we don't get to your question today, um, you can always email me wtilson at caselearning.com. And if you're interested in any information about our programs, uh, we're teaching our next webinars uh, September 4th to 21st next month, um, and then going straight into a full five-day program, uh, doing it in person. So uh, we offer people a choice: you can come have it in person. Um, if you want to, uh, if you live in the New York area or want to travel here, and we do it over five intensive days, the three-day boot camp and each of the one-day seminars on Thursday and Friday, um, or uh, you can do it over 15 two and a half hour modules from 7 to 9.30 every morning. Uh, New York time, we've had people at our last webinar, uh, were participating live uh, from all, uh, all over Europe, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, South Korea. So uh, the early morning New York time works per perfectly uh, for the people uh, in Asia because it's after work for them. So um, either webinar or in person, uh, we've had great experiences teaching people at both. So just go to caselearning.com for more information about that. So uh, hey, hey, Whitney, with that, Whitney, Whitney, we got a bunch of questions on the chat line. Yeah. Um, I'd like to encourage people to raise their hand as well, because if you raise your hand, we can uh, try and spotlight you and um, make it a little more interactive. 
But, um, you know, it, it, to get started, um, I, I, th I think there's a terrific, really, first question here um, that, that someone wanted to ask, which was, how do you judge, measure, whether you're a good investor or not? Is it simply beating the S&P? What else would you, can be, would, what else would you consider it useful to measure? How long a time period do you need uh, to consider this? Yeah, um, let me uh, tackle that briefly, Glenn. It's a great question, um, and then you can dive in. Um, uh, so it's a great question because we're nine years into a bull market, and it's especially hard to tell if you're a talented investor during a bull market. And in fact, if um, the winning strategy, uh, there are two winning strategies for the past nine years. Number one, take on risk. The more risk you have taken, the more Bitcoin you've bought, uh, the better your returns have been for the past nine years, as an example. And number two, buy every dip. Um, and uh, those uh, strategies can work during certain uh, markets like this one, and they can work for an extended period of time. Uh, but those two strategies uh, applied recklessly and without judgment and thought will blow you up. It's just a question of when. So um, there are a lot of bull market geniuses out there these days. Um, and I know because I was one, I came into the investing world in the late 90s during the tail end of a 17 year bull market. And, uh, um, and I thought I was God's gift to investing. And I look back and I just cringe at what a clueless fool I was. Um, and you know, I was buying AOL. I, I still remember um, back when I didn't have very much money at all. And I put my wife's uh, IRA, which had $20,000 into it, into AOL in 1998. And a year later, it was up 6X. Um, and uh, $20,000 was $120,000. And that one investment, more than any other, is what got me really passionate about investing. I thought this was the greatest thing ever. Um, and, uh, and, and what caused me to run out and launch my own fund, which in hindsight was a terrible idea um, by all rights. Uh, I should have been blown sky high because, again, I was a bull market genius. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so, uh, so I would caution every young person out there, especially if you did not live uh, managing money through 2008, 2009, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Markets sometimes go down. The market, the S&P has not had a down year since 2008. Um, sometimes markets go down a couple years in a row. So the question that was asked though is, is well, how do I tell if I'm a bull market genius? Uh, uh, one way to do it is, is there have been approximately, if I recall correctly, there have been 30 months um, that have had uh, down months since the bottom in March of 09. Go back and look at how your portfolio performed during those 30 months. I think cumulatively during those 30 months, the market was down 138% or something like that. If you multiply it all out, um, go back and look month by month and cumulatively how your portfolio is performed. And that, 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 that's probably the best test that you can do uh, right now uh, to see uh, whether you're just, uh, you know, piling on and uh, taking, taking a lot of risk or whether you're um, sensibly managing risk. Um, Glenn, what would you add to that? I would add a few things. One is, I would be obsessive about quantifying your performance. And that's because it's really, really easy to fall into the, the mental traps of what's going on while you're investing. You remember the successes, you know, you, you sweep under the rugs, the, uh, um, the failures. Um, and, and some of the little things that you do from a decision-making perspective, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll tend to forget. So if you're very obsessive about when you make decisions, why you make decisions, and how those decisions turned out, you'll, you'll, you'll answer that question that you asked probably a little bit better. I will say that most people that have decent intelligence um, have the capacity to be good investors. But this is, um, it, it's, it's not gambling. This is, this is serious. You need to study this craft. You need to you need to learn from the best out there. Um, you know you, you need to read Buffett. You need to read Munger. You need to read Ben Graham um, and Fisher and everybody else. Um, so you, you need to be very intellectually curious about it. You need to study investor temperament. Investor temperament is so 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 important, and um, understanding your own temperament. And once you've done all those things, I think you'll know whether you're a good investor or not. And the likelihood is 
you have the capacity to be a good investor, whether you put that into the playbook or not, whether you implement it or not, you know, that's, uh, most people don't, so. Yeah, um, and by the way, of course, Glenn, I'm sure you forgot to mention, in addition to reading all of those things, you have to come take a, our case learning programs. Um, <laughs> well, actually, I embedded, I embedded that in what I said, but I think it was slightly subtler than that. Yes, uh, well, let me be more overt. And uh, speaking of which, uh, I'm gonna highlight uh, one of our students for the past, uh, uh, who took our, just took our webinar, uh, Dimitri. Um, and, uh, uh, and go ahead with your question, Dimitri. Uh, you're muted right now, I hear. I think I just unmuted you. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello, Whitney, Glenn. Long time. <laughs> it's been a day, I guess. Um, well, first of all, very thankful for the webinar. Really learned a lot and really, really highly recommend it to everybody. You will get way more than you expect. And I still have a lot of questions. And my question was actually transitioned to where we're talking right now. It's uh, what's your framework on the macro? Uh, right now, like after 20 years, because I, I guess you've been changing your views, whether you need to be really aware of what's going on ahead or how do you go nowadays? Like, do you have to be aware of where you are now? Or are you concerned about where we're going in terms of the macro factors, like where we are and where we are right now in your view as yeah. a market? One, one of the reasons um, I closed my fund last fall is, is because um, I did not see anything imminent that was likely to blow the world up in the same way that I felt that way in late 99, early 2000 about the internet bubble. Um, and in early 2008, when we got conviction about the housing bubble, um, you know, j uh, there are certainly plenty of things I can point to uh, the use of nuclear weapons on the Korean peninsula, a major trade war erupting in the developed world. Um, you know, China's debt bubble and, uh, you know, the huge debt burden uh, in Japan, two of the world's largest economies that could really encounter distress. Like there are plenty of things that the nervous Nelly and me could point to. But, you know, by and large, generally speaking, the world economy is doing pretty well. And the U.S. probably better, better than the rest. And I'm mostly a U.S. focused investor. So, um, you know, the, the story of the past uh, nine years for me, perhaps because I was so scarred by 2008, 2009, I kept seeing another big downturn around the corner, and I was so fearful of that that I positioned my portfolio very defensively for the past nine years with a lot of cash, a big short book, and that just proved to be deadly. It was absolutely the wrong positioning. Um, we badly trailed this long bull market, and eventually my investors and I just got fatigued. Um, so going forward, um, managing money in my new separately managed accounts business, I'm not going to do any of that. It's going to be 100% invested, uh, long only, um, uh, in my five to ten favorite stocks, um, and that's the that's the strategy I think uh, over a long period of time uh, that I can uh, handily beat the S&P 500. That's my goal. So I'm not trying to run a hedge fund, deliver absolute returns in all markets, that kind of thing. I think there are some people who are good at that. I'm I'm just not one of them. I recognize that. Unfortunately, it took me too long to recognize that, um, and I had to suffer a lot of pain in the meantime. Uh, but um, um, but what that means is is I'm not going to put all of my own money into uh, into my new funds, uh, nor am I going to put all my parents' retirement money or anything like that. This is going to be the 10 or 20 percent of my portfolio and, and and my investors' portfolio where we're gonna have more volatility, obviously a five to 10 stock portfolio is gonna be more volatile, uh, but, uh, and it's gonna be long only. So if the market goes down 20%, my portfolio might go down, you know, somewhere in that range and that's okay uh, because we're gonna have other dry powder outside of uh, uh, the accounts I'm managing. Um, and uh, frankly, I don't think it's a super attractive environment. I'm not finding a lot of cheap stocks. Um, and that means, uh, you know, I'm not gonna wade in and put all my capital um, uh, into the market here. Uh, but, uh, but I am finding a, a few, two of my favorite stocks remain Berkshire Hathaway that just reported mind blowingly great earnings uh, on Saturday morning. Uh, I think you will keep up with the market in an up market and do quite a bit better than the market in a down market owning Berkshire. Um, and Howard Hughes, uh, which we've owned for the better part of a decade since it came out of uh, part of the general growth property uh, bankruptcy since it came out. Uh, they own South Street Seaport here in New York. I urge everybody in New York to check it out. Um, it's an amazing development uh, that I think could be a, a real driver for the stock uh, over the next year. So I'm finding a few things to do, but uh, 
um, you know, my general macro view is, is I'm not finding a lot of great stocks that uh, tells me, you know, to be a little cautious. On the other hand, I'm not seeing anything that I think is likely to really shake things up. You know, this bull market could go on for another 10 years. Uh, you know, the last long bull market, uh, you know, real long one was 17 years long, right at the uh, end that ended right at the start of my investing career. Anything to add, Glenn? Uh, yes. Um, so I think the best thing that the bull market has going for it right now um, is there's not uh, um, a huge amount of enthusiasm going on right now. Um, and when bull markets sort of tend to exhaust, it's because everybody's jumped on and everybody's enthusiastic. What it has going against it, I think, is, is, um, is, is at least a warning flag. And that is valuations are at the high end um, and the very high end of historical norms. Um, if you look at the three historical valuation peaks, um, we're, we're, we're right up with those. Um, the difference between this and the 2000 peak is the very, very high valuation tech companies actually are worth um, you know, arguably uh, the range of where they're trading versus back then they were trading on air. But overall aggregate valuations are quite high and interest rates are extremely low and likely to go up um, because of the unwinding of QE. And interest rates going up is gravity to stocks. And so um, I think that there's a, a, a reason to be cautious on, on a macro basis. And I completely agree with Whitney that trying to time um, uh, that caution uh, in the form of uh, an investment strategy is, uh, is very dangerous because uh, you'll, you'll get the timing wrong. So uh, I, I, Whitney said, stocks do go down. They do. Recessions happen. They do. Um, stocks will go down at some point in the future. Um, we're closer to the peak um, than we were yesterday because time is passing. But I don't know if it's tomorrow or, or next year or, or as Whitney says, 10 years. So how would you recommend us young guys to think about macro? Like what should we do when we analyze companies bottom up? Like should we just look at the good value right now and not even think about the future? Like as a macro, should we kind of keep it at the back of our head? Like should, how to go? You should do what Ben Graham figured out, you know, long, long, long time ago, which is analyze the business that you're looking at buying. Think about it like, a, um, like an office building. Um, think about the yields associated with the rents on that office building and think about the yields associated with the companies that you are buying. Find a company that you want to buy and then you know, find a bunch of them and wait till the stock price gets to a point where it's at a price where you want to buy that, that particular business that you're talking about. Um, and as Whitney said, we'd love to own all of Howard Hughes. You know, and if the market closed, that's fine because of the value we think that it's going to create. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, in, in my view, has a cash yield, um, and that is the cash from operations that you're gonna get based on the stock price that you're buying, um, that has a pretty good margin of safety embedded in that. So that's, you know, whether interest rates go up or not, I think Berkshire as a business will do very well, and I think it's trading at a fair value. So therefore, over time, you're gonna make money in that. Yeah, my suggestion, Dimitri, to most investors um, is don't pay any attention to the macro. Um, with the caveat that once in a blue moon, if you're absolutely convinced that the world isn't just might fall apart at some point in the future, but is actually falling apart right now. Um, and that's what certainly what was happening uh, as the internet bubble collapsed. And it's certainly what happened as the housing bubble collapsed. Uh, but right now there's nothing that's collapsing right now. The, the world is, is, is quite strong. So the people who are sort of have bearish views right now, I think are betting on something bad that might happen in the future, but probably won't. Uh, you know, value investors have predicted uh, 10 of the last zero recessions. Um, so my, my, se my sense is, is that you should uh, invest almost all of your time in trying to find companies that earnings are going to double, if not go up 5X. If you can find a company that's earning a dollar a share today, that earns $2 or ideally $5 a share in three to five years, um, that stock's going up um, if you're right about what happens to earnings. Um, and, uh, and that doesn't mean, by the way, just go out and buy willy-nilly the highest growth stocks because there you're probably paying a very high price 
um, and you're going to suffer hideously if the company doesn't achieve the huge expectations built into the stock. Um, you know, often it's just a beaten down company that uh, that for whatever reason earnings are depressed short term, and you bet correctly that earnings rebound substantially, right? Um, so it, that can, it can be a growth investment, uh, a classic growth investment or a classic value investment, but spend all of your time focusing on the fundamental performance of the business, ma mainly its profitability, and find companies where uh, profits go up a lot, where the market is not expecting profits to go up a lot. Those are the multi-bagger kind of stocks uh, that will make your career. I, I suspect from you know having had you in our webinar for the last uh, 12 days or so, that that's your forte, that you can do that successfully if you're really focused and disciplined um, and don't make a lot of bets. You only find a handful of these uh, if you do a lot of work over the course of each year. Um, and don't spend a lot of time try, trying to be some macro prognosticator. Um, that's generally for almost all investors, a sucker's game. And you know the saying, uh, if it's in the headlines, it's in the stock price. True. Yeah, you know, it's, it's seductive to try and nail the macro environment. There's a lot of facts out there. There's a lot of experts out there. Um, and uh, th there's sort of an intellectual element to the puzzle. Um, people have gotten, very, very smart people, have gotten the Japan trade wrong for 30 years. And they're very, very uh, thorough analyses. And it's easy to, to, to get a hold of it, but it hasn't worked. And the job in this business is to, to figure out something that's going to make you money. And the thing that we know makes money is buying a stock at a reasonable value where the business underlying business is going to grow earnings, um, as Whitney said, to a, to a uh, relatively rap at a relatively rapid pace. Yeah. Um, well, Glenn, if you want to pull the next question off the chat line, um, Sanjeet uh, Mavia raised his hand. Um, I don't see his video on, but let me uh, unmute and, uh, Go ahead, Sanjeet. Uh, we can. Uh, we should be able to hear you. We can't hear you. Yeah. So perhaps you could you could type um, on the chat line. But Whitney, let me ask the next question here. Sure. Charlie Munger has multiple times recommended investing more in China. He's even said the best Chinese companies are cheaper than the best American companies. However, China has macro um, and debt related issues as risks. Um, is Charlie just ignoring this macro? How would you or Charlie recommend investing in Chinese companies? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Charlie has said that. Um, Charlie's a big admirer of China and the Chinese people. Um, and, you know, their incredible entrepreneurial capitalist nature, um, you know, super focused, disciplined, uh, you know, very focused on education, etc. all the things that Charlie Munger loves. Um, Charlie Munger um, has an advantage of having Lee Lu as his right-hand guy. Uh, Lee Lu's a good friend, an amazing guy, and uh, he's uh, Charlie's eyes and ears uh, on China. Um, the, the problem with China is, is that it is, it's a hybrid between a capitalist but also sort of a kleptocracy, a capitalist system combined with a kleptocracy combined with sort of an authoritarian dictatorship. Um, so it's uh, and uh, it's the Wild West. It's like the United States was, you know, back in the late 1800s, for example, uh, you know, rife with insider information. Um, the rule of law uh, often does not apply. Uh, and uh, I know so many people who've gotten burned investing in China. Um, there is not a culture of protecting passive minority outside investors. Um, in fact, uh, sort of foreign investors are often seen as just sort of suckers to exploit. Um, and good luck uh, having recourse in the Chinese courts, right? So my strong advice to the average person is do not invest in anything in China ever. Um, that is, is advice for most people. However, um, there's no question China is a booming economy. There's all sorts of opportunity there. It's just that if you don't have an edge, if you don't speak the language, if you don't have relationships, you know, the way Li Lu does, um, you're going to uh, very likely um, be the sucker at the poker table, get taken advantage of and lose all your money. Right. So um, the other risk for everyone, whether you're Li Lu or not, is, is, you know, there are a lot of factors in China today that remind me a lot of the United States in 2005, 6 and 7 as our as our uh, bubble inflated. 
um, uh, uh, you know, skyrocketing uh, land and housing prices, um, uh, construction boom uh, that appears unsustainable, um, and uh, all sorts of uh, government manipulation um, and fraud um, and hidden. Here's the key: what really blew up the world in 2008 and 9 wasn't the leverage you could see; it was the stuff that it was off balance sheet. Um, and uh, so, so uh, there. Uh, I'm not predicting that it's going to happen. I don't think it's likely to happen. China has, you know, massive foreign reserves, you know, trillions of dollars. Um, and the government values stability over everything else, so it actively manages uh, all of these markets. And if there were ever uh, signs of sort of a major collapse, the government would come in and just almost like mandate it, slash pour, pour money into it to prevent things from getting really ugly. So I don't think it's likely, but I think there's a, a, a real risk factor. Um, and uh, if China blows up, it could really, uh, you know, uh, cause ripple effects around the world as the second world's second largest economy. So, uh, so those are sort of my overall uh, cautionary uh, cautionary words. By the way, to give you a sense of the kind of wild west that China is, is uh, go watch the new uh, documentary, The China Hustle. Um, you know, which was uh, I don't know, 400 Chinese companies went public in the U.S. market via reverse mergers. I'd say at least 80% of them were outright frauds. Um, and kudos to the uh, brave and smart short sellers who uh, figured that out um, and um, uh, exposed it. Um, and but it, you can you can learn a lot from watching that movie. So so that that movie happens to be free on Netflix now, by the way. So uh, it's pretty easy uh, to get a hold of. Um, I want to amplify just one thing that Whitney said there. Um, and it has to do with sort of your local expertise and your circle of confidence. We were teaching um, the, the, the boot camp in London, and I was talking to one of the students about a very, very cheap Indian company. And so, you know, he, he pulled up the information he, and he said, oh, but that company is located in blank, blank, blank. And that's the, that's the home of overhyped frauds um, in India. And you, you want to avoid companies that come from there, that are based there. See, that's the sort of local insight I might know in the United States. I know some places in the United States that they're incorporated in, um, in uh, um, Nevada and have uh, um, uh, their um, law based in Florida. Then um, you, got some, you got some real issues with that particular company. So you, you got to know what you don't know. And in some of those uh, situations like China, maybe there's some stuff you don't know that uh, you don't know you don't know. Um, Whitney, here's an unbelievably terrific question. Um, given that you are friends with so many high profile, super rich guys with big, big, big funds, how did you avoid envy during your tenure? Buffett and Munger are the backbone of dozens of investing um, uh, professionals. Apart from stocks, what have you learned from them outside of investing? Uh, so let me address the first question, envy. Um, I won't claim to be 100% immune from envy. Um, it's awful nice flying on a, a big private jet as a way to get around. Um, and I've flown on quite a few of them uh, with my much richer friends. Um, but, you know, look, uh, I came from nothing, uh, you know, never never wanted for anything. But, uh, you know, my parents were both teachers. Uh, um, and, you know, my mom knows how to squeeze a dollar. And, uh, you know, I wore only secondhand clothes uh, growing up. We never, never, ever had a new car. We'd buy 10 year old cars and my dad would nurse them along till they were 20 years old. Um, but uh, I had a magnificent childhood, wouldn't have traded it for, for anything. Um, and I just feel so incredibly fortunate in my life to, you know, have gotten, uh, gone to Harvard and Harvard Business School and uh, been able to pretty much do what I love to do over the past 30 years since I graduated from college, um, you know, made uh, a nice amount of money uh, during the good years um, for the first dozen years or so with uh, my fund. Um, and uh, most importantly, married a great woman and we have three wonderful kids and, you know, I'm, I'm the luckiest guy on earth. Um, the fact that uh, a few other guys, I happen to be friends with so many people in the industry, it seems like a lot, but it's really only a handful of people who really, really hit it big um, and who were smarter investors, put up bigger numbers, were better entrepreneurs, you know, built the team out and raised a lot more money um, and uh, made, uh, you know, not just retirement money, but 10x or 100x retirement money. 
uh, it doesn't really bother me. Um, it, it, it just doesn't. Yes, it would be nice to never have to work again um, and to be able to fly around on a private jet and have multiple luxurious homes, but I've got a pretty incredible life and I'm not sure I'd trade my life for any with, with any one of those folks. Um, so, uh, so envy hasn't been a problem. And I always remember what Charlie Munger said. He said, you know, of the seven deadly sins, envy is the dumbest one because it's the only one you can't have any fun with, right? You know, adultery and gluttony and all, you know, they're sins, uh, but, uh, but you can have great fun sinning, right? Envy, it just makes yourself miserable. You know, who, who would want that? We're, we're, uh, we're not promoting any sins, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's just, uh, I, I did like that. Uh, that Munger quote. You know, both Whitney and I um, have many uh, uh, acquaintances and friends uh, who are, you know, well into the multi-billion dollar category. Um, and uh, some of his closest friends in the world uh, fall into that category. Some of my closest friends in the world fall into that category. Um, and, you know, if, if that's what, it's sort of difficult. You're not going to live a happy life if that's what you're, what, if you're going to let envy get any part of that, uh, any component of your life um, there. Uh, the people that I know that are super rich, um, they have all of my problems and then some. Um, and the, the wealth didn't solve very many of them. Now, Whitney and I are both very, um, you know, we have nothing to complain about. Um, it, with respect to how we live. But, you know, if I had a, a, a tenth of what I have now, um, I'd still be the same uh, person that I am and I'd still enjoy life the way that I enjoy it. And if I had a hundred times what I have now, um, I think the only thing that it would do is it would really, um, uh, my, my privacy would be far, far more invaded. And I value my, I, I value sort of living the way that I live. Yeah, so Glenn, the second part of that question actually sort of I was talking about, you know, how I, I one of the ways I learned uh, that how dumb it is to feel envy um, is, you know, from hearing Munger talk about it. So if I recall, the second part of that question is, is sort of what are the non-investing stuff I've learned from Buffett and Munger? Is that, um, uh, was, was, am I correct that that was the uh, second part of that question? Yes. Um, so let me, um, I'm actually going to pull up a, a slide presentation here. Um, uh, hold on just a second. It'll, uh, um, yeah, while you're pulling it up, Whitney, let me just chat for a moment on another sure. question. You can come back to it. Sure. Um, one of the questions is Berkshire's marginally outperformed the S&P 500 over the last 10 years and underperformed the NASDAQ. Is the tech underweighting of Berkshire becoming a disadvantage? Um, look, you know, it's easy in hindsight to look at Amazon and Facebook and Google and say that they've grown very, very fast. And if Berkshire had owned them, um, it would have grown faster. Uh, sort of, I guess that's somewhat definitional. Um, Buffett has a very um, powerful discipline when it comes to circle of competence. He didn't um, feel that he understood Amazon sufficiently uh, as an investment. He recognizes that he missed Google, um, and we think he still should buy it. Um, uh, and, and Berkshire's underperformance over uh, that period of time is interesting. They were far, far more conservatively positioned, and they did keep up with the S&P. And they, they will tend to underperform um, in super hot markets, and they'll massively outperform in down markets is, is the expectation. Look, I mean, uh, having grown from nothing to uh, um, half a trillion dollar market value, uh, one of the highest revenue companies um, in the United States, they're doing an awful lot right. Um, he could have made the right tech decisions and done better, and he could have made the wrong tech decisions and done worse. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's a disadvantage. I think the the power of the of the built of the business that they've built, you know, is eminently sustainable. Yeah. So Glenn, while you uh, check the next question to pull up, let me just uh, pull up my slide presentation here, which is an overview of the new book. Um, that I'm working on. Uh, I just, I'm working with a ghost writing firm called Book in a Box, um, which I've had a very good experience with, 25,000 bucks, and they uh, have a whole team of people working with you to help you uh, think about your book. Um, and, 
um, and, and lay it out uh, and then work with a ghostwriter to actually um, uh, you know, write the book. Um, so I just got the first draft of the book, 263 pages from my ghostwriter. It's going to require a lot of work uh, for, from me to really flesh it out. So you know, maybe end of the year we'll get the book out. But um, the, 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 the concept for the book came from the very first group of students that I was teaching back in December. Uh, it was a five-day program, and I had prepared to teach them roughly 60% investing, 40% entrepreneurship about how to start your own fund, right? And then we ended up spending, you know, maybe 25% of our time on uh, uh, on things that were not related to either of those two topics about, uh, you know, some of my observations about people who had happy marriages versus those that ended in divorce, for example. Um, about avoiding calamities. And I realized all this stuff I learned from Buffett and Munger uh, over the years. And, uh, you know, I thought I had my, my oldest daughter was sitting in the back of that seminar. And I realized that I had not sit down, sat down and taught my daughter all of these life lessons that I picked up over the years, not just from Buffett and Munger, starting first and foremost from my parents, um, but that I really owed it to my children to um, to put in the effort and to uh, uh, to write down all these life lessons. Um, so um, that's what this book is primarily about. If uh, if only three people ever read this book, but it makes a difference in their lives, those three people being my three daughters, um, I will consider it worth the effort. And if it helps anybody else uh, uh, think about their life a little and live their life a little better and differently going forward and avoid a calamity or two, um, then then all the better. So. Um, um, so the title is Beyond Value Investing, Life Lessons from Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and Me. And all I'm going to just show you is the chapters uh, that we've come up with. So um, how to succeed by, uh, by really trying, uh, becoming a learning machine, developing expertise, the importance of your integrity and reputation, uh, being nice, uh, being philanthropic and making a difference in the world, uh, developing good habits and starting early with that. Uh, developing self-awareness and modesty, um, the most important habits of getting and staying healthy, both in terms of diet and fitness mostly, uh, making life interesting by taking on challenges, uh, the importance of patience and delayed gratification, how to deal with mistakes and apologize, um, and the uh, incredible importance of feeling gratitude. Uh, entire chapter on marrying the right person, Another chapter on once you've married the right person, how to maintain a healthy marriage uh, for the rest of your life. Um, and then some, uh, another chapter on um, family relationships and uh, raising kids. Um, uh, followed by chapters on winning friends uh, and influencing people, cultivating mentors, developing long-term relationships and deep friendships. Um, then pivoting to uh, what Munger talks about, uh, all I wanna know is where I'm gonna die so I never go there and how to think, you know, once you've achieved some level of success, uh, the most important thing you can do is not screw it up. And so I've really gone through and studied how successful people's lives have been disrupted, if not ruined. Um, and it falls into five major categories, uh, death or serious injury of you or a loved one, uh, a marriage that goes south ending in divorce, losing uh, your freedom and reputation, getting thrown in jail. Um, um, number four is losing all your money. Uh, number five is addiction and abuse. And then lastly, since some of these calamities are sure to happen to you, um, some thoughts on how to deal with them. So those are, um, uh, those are uh, uh, the chapters and the outline uh, of my book. I'm pretty excited about it. Glenn, you want to throw up the next question? You're muted right now. And by the way, anybody who wants to skip the line, because there are a lot of questions, we're not going to get to all of them, um, have a little courage. Uh, ask your question uh, in person via video. Um, and, uh, and you're much more likely to have the opportunity to ask your question. Uh, so go ahead, Glenn. So yeah, so Sanjeet's um, question, which um, you know we weren't able to get live, was, um, since there are a handful of business schools in, the Nor in North America that teach in, um, value investing, a small handful, including Columbia, was it difficult to learn the Graham and Dodd style of investing that they, uh, since you didn't go to Columbia, um, would you still put a he heavy emphasis on the book's security analysis? 
Um, well, the first question, sort of ironically, I didn't go to Columbia, but uh, my first really formative learning experience, uh, educational experience, um, other than starting to go to the Berkshire meetings, was sitting in on Joel Greenblatt's class at Columbia Business School in the spring of 2000. And I heard about the class. Uh, I was so eager to learn. And I found out where it was, and I just quietly went in. I sat in the back of the classroom, didn't identify myself or anything. But then after the first class, I went up to him. I introduced myself. I said, I'm a big fan. I've read your book. Um, you know, would you mind if I sat in the back of the class? And he was a little uncomfortable. And he said, look, I'm not supposed to allow this. But if you be quiet, you can't ask any questions or be part participate in the class. That's for the students. But if you just want to sit in the back of the classroom and and uh, and, and and be invisible, uh, I'll allow it. And uh, there began a great, great, great 20-year friendship. Um, Joel has been an incredible friend and mentor to me. But also keep in mind, this was the absolute peak of the internet bubble. Uh, it was the last few months in the spring of 2000. The Nasdaq peaked on March 10th of 2000, and there I was. Um, learning special situations and value investing from the master Joel Greenblatt. Uh, um, and it was absolutely critical because keep in mind, as I said earlier, I was a total bull market genius. I still owned a bunch of tech stocks at this time because they were working and I thought I was a genius. Um, and Joel was one of the key factors that helped me recognize that this was just a gigantic bubble and the way I needed to think about investing and multiples of earnings and that kind of thing. And of course, at the peak of the internet bubble, everything else was crazy cheap. You could buy great businesses, you know, at five times earnings that, that just weren't in the tech or nifty 50 space, right? So um, my, uh, my, there are so many ways to learn now with the internet, um, you know, in, including our webinars, of course, uh, but uh, so much free stuff out there. Uh, we put out a ton of free stuff in addition to our paid programs. Um, so um, uh, if you want to go to our website at tilsonfunds.com, uh, there's a list of recommended reading. Um, notice uh, security analysis is not on that list. Um, I actually don't think security analysis is, is uh, you should definitely read it. Um, it should be on your checklist, but um, I don't think uh, it's one of the first books I would recommend. I would start with The Intelligent Investor. Uh, then I would pivot to reading all the Berkshire Hathaway uh, annual letters uh, that are posted at BerkshireHathaway.com. Um, I'd go back and read all the old Buffett partnership letters. Um, I was the first person to compile all of those letters and then scan them um, uh, and put them out there. It was one of the ways, early ways, I sort of made a name for myself in the value investing community. So, um, so I'm not disparaging security analysis. Um, I, I just think there's a lot of other stuff um, that I'd probably read first. Anything you'd add, Glenn? Security analysis is, is much more of a textbook. Um, it is, uh, um, it's harder to read and it's, you know, um, and, and it's probably, the principles still endure, but out of all the books out there, it would probably read as the most dated. Yeah. Um, John uh, Yanone has a, a question. I don't see a video, but um, I do see audio. Um, go ahead, John, and uh, uh, I think we should be able to hear you. No? Uh, we're still having problems with, uh, with that. So, uh, Glenn, you want to grab the next question off the chat line? Yes, please. Um, do you believe there's been a fundamental shift in the economic landscape that's caused growth stocks to outperform value stocks, or do you believe it's just another cycle that's about to end? Does the growth stock emergence necessitate a change in more traditional concepts of value investing? Yeah, um, I, uh, um, so to be specific, if I recall correctly from David Einhorn's uh, uh, Q2 letter, um, uh, Glenn, do you remember the exact statistic? But it was something like over the past year and a half or two years, not, not a very long period of time, the growth index has massively, not a small amount, massively outperformed the value index. Um, and uh, it definitely does remind me back of 1999, early 2000. Um, and, um, you know, it's a little different this time uh, for a couple of reasons, though. One is, is that a lot of these growth stocks, uh, you know, the Facebook, Googles uh, of the world are generating enormous earnings. In other words, they're not even trading at crazy multiples like back in, you know, 99, 2000. You know, Cisco had earnings, but it was trading at 150 times earnings, you know. 
Same thing with Microsoft and Intel. Um, real companies, real earnings, but the multiples had just gotten completely crazy. You know, whereas today, um, you know, Google trades at 20, you know, adjusted for cash. If you want to make some adjustments for YouTube and um, their other bets, you know, maybe trading well below t uh, 20 times earnings. You know, Facebook, uh, with its recent hiccup, is trading under 30 times this year's earnings. And these companies are still growing at enormous rates, right? So one, the, you know, yes, there are, uh, you know, the Salesforce.coms of the world trading at 15 times revenues that basically have no gap earnings. Um, but uh, um, I don't feel like growth stocks, uh, the game is about to tip over in the same way that I felt in early 2000. Um, to the extent this is a bubble, I think the bubble could inflate a lot further from here. Um, here's the other thing, uh, value stocks um, aren't cheap the way they were back then. There was, uh, you know, back then it was just, it was like shooting fish in a barrel as a value investor, as long as you just stayed outside the internet bubble and the nifty 50, you know, handful of uh, high flying growth stocks, right? Today, the market seems pretty fairly to richly valued across the board. I was surprised when I saw that statistic that growth has so wildly outperformed value, because obviously I can see that the growth stocks have been doing well, but I, I don't see the value stocks uh, you know, completely in the toilet. I'm not finding huge bargains where I typically look in value land. Um, so, so it's just a hard environment right now. It's a hard environment. And so uh, just recognizing it's a hard environment, but I'm not seeing any obvious bubble that's about to burst anywhere other than the ongoing implosion of the whole cryptocurrency Bitcoin bubble, uh, which, I, which I predicted and, and which I still think has a lot more to go on the downside. Um, anything to add, Glenn? No, let's move to the next question here, which is, um, it seems that more and more companies are investing in their future growth through the earnings account, R&D and marketing, rather than through their capital investment. Um, have you noticed such a trend and does it justify today's higher multiples as current earnings are somewhat depressed? So um, let, let, me, let me restate that question. Um, in, the old, uh, in many old, quote, old economy companies, um, let's use General Motors as an example, um, they're investing in their future by um, through the cash flow statement, through capital expenditures, and then an in the income statement that comes through as depreciation uh, over time, over the future time. Whereas the new economy companies, let's use Google as an example, rather than uh, employing capital through the cash flow statement, they're just employing it through the income statement. Um, their, their capital expenditures equivalent is R&D dollars. Now, if you think about it, that's a much more conservative way to present an earnings statement because rather than the, the capital being, all the capital being spent um, in Google's uh, case is being expensed the year that it's being spent versus in General Motors case, it's being expensed through depreciation over a much, much longer time frame. So I think it's much more conservative to present the information in the way that um, uh, the, the newer economy companies are doing. However, because they need to do that, it means that they're equivalent of a moat um, is probably somewhat less um, predictable than it is in an older line um, company where the moat is defined by um, capital that's been employed in the company. So, so I think it's, it's probably a more conservative way to um, uh, present the, the economics. And so you have to take that into account when comparing two companies um, that one in an old economy and one in a new economy, economy basis. I think the difference that you're trying to point out here um, is somewhat amplified because of the bull market. And I think uh, in, in a less robust bull market, um, the distinctions wouldn't be quite as great. So that's my, uh, that's my. Yeah, question. Glenn, um, let me, um, there's a bigger question that sort of emerges from this, which is when you look, for example, at the market today trading on a price to sales basis, it's pretty much near its all time high. Um, and, you know, does that mean we're in sort of bubble territory? Um, and this sort of relates to, you know, how companies, you know, what's driving the market. And I do think the world has changed a bit. And I am cautious, you know, the four most dangerous words in investing are this time is different. But I do think this time is a little different in that there has been an emergence of companies like led by Google and Facebook that have the two greatest business models in the history of the world. Um, and Buffett and Munger were sort of chuckling about this and almost shaking their heads 
at how they missed it. They never could have predicted that you can have businesses. Look at Google and Facebook's business model, which is basically they can expand to every human being on earth um, with no, uh, virtually no CapEx, no inventory, no accounts receivable, um, um, and they can just expand so rapidly in a way that has never existed in the history of humanity. There has never, it has never been possible for a business uh, to, to grow like this in a capital light way. And you know what? Those businesses are worth six or 10 or 12 times revenues because of those uh, economic characteristics. Um, I'm reminded when, uh, back when I owned Netflix, um, Netflix opened up in Scandinavia and they got the rights to stream the content into Scandinavia. Um, and uh, they flipped a switch, ran a few ads, um, and within a matter of months, they were doing a couple hundred million dollar revenue run rate in Scandinavia. And guess how many employees Netflix had in Scandinavia to, uh, from a standing start, be doing a $200 million revenue run rate business? And the answer is zero. Never in the history of the world has it been possible to flip a switch, be doing a couple hundred million dollars on the other side of the world from where you're headquartered, you know, in brand new virgin territory and not have to hire a single human being, right? It's incredible. Uh, so, so um, you know, that, uh, th th those characteristics that are shared by a lot of the businesses that account for uh, a disproportionate share of the market indices, uh, I think make comparisons to past periods. Uh, you gotta, you, you're not quite comparing apples to oranges, but you're not comparing identical apples to identical apples either. Uh, the, the, the nature of uh, the business models uh, that are rooted in the internet um, and, and even old, older economy businesses that are utilizing the internet, um, I think has resulted in, in companies that have um, sort of that have lighter business models uh, that are deserving of uh, somewhat uh, higher multiples. The next question, Whitney, is why did you as an investor focus on large cap companies? Yeah, I didn't. Um, actually, if you looked at the portfolio when I closed up, um, it was a whole range. Now, I tended to write about more of the larger companies. You know, I've been writing about Berkshire Hathaway for 20 years. Um, and I and I did own uh, and still own a little bit of Google and Facebook near the end, but I also own shares in RDI, Reading International, uh, which is a, I don't know a couple hundred million dollar market cap company. Um, you know, my most successful investment last year was Hertz, uh, which was down to a sub billion dollar market cap, under ten dollars a share, down eighty percent last year with a fifty percent short interest, and I caught it for a nice bounce, you know, a double in six weeks. Um, uh, I own, uh, you know, Fannie and Freddie, uh, which are, you know, really sort of a special situation off the beaten path. Um, um, you know, made a, a couple times in the past uh, couple years, I've gotten into Spirit Airlines uh, when the stock has really gotten beaten down. Uh, when the big airlines are engaged in spanking actions against Spirit uh, and the stock gets crushed, um, you know, that's probably down to a two or three billion dollar market cap. So. Uh, so it was a real mix. I was sort of market cap agnostic, but, and to some extent, I deliberately structured my portfolio to have a, a mix of different kinds of investments, but also uh, a different range of market caps as part trying to build a diversified portfolio. Uh, Glenn, I just got an email from Paul Stasek, um, uh, and uh, he writes, I'm 18, have read plenty of investment and finance related books. I've read all of Ben Graham's work and have been managing my own account for the past six months. What would be your best piece of advice for someone my age wanting to first work at a hedge fund and then later start my own hedge fund given I can provide returns that are appealing to investors? Uh, it's a great question, Paul. And the most important thing is, is that you're engaging in this and thinking about this and learning and actually running real money. And I don't care if it's 5,000 bucks or 1,000 bucks. You can set up an E-Trade account or a Meritrade account or something and uh, just start actually, you know, with a small amount of money as part of the learning process is, is actually put some skin in the game. Um, and if you got a thousand bucks, uh, uh, buy five $200 positions and five stocks that you think uh, are cheap. And that's sort of how you start to learn. So um, my best advice is, is at the age of 18, meaning you're finishing high school, you're going off to college, go to the most selective college you can get into. Um, 
that will give you the, where you'll be surrounded by other really smart students and the very best professors and you'll have a good credential. Um, so get credentialed is the first part. Um, secondly, uh, move to a big city if you don't already live in one. Um, that's where it's happening. Uh, that's where opportunities are out, out there for other really smart, ambitious young people. Um, and, uh, and then, so that's just general advice um, and the advice I've given my daughters. And that's in fact what my oldest daughter is, uh, my two oldest uh, daughters are in the process of doing. Um, and I'm delighted that my oldest daughter's coming back uh, to New York City and working at a world world known brand name firm like Ernst & Young, coming out of uh, not as big a brand name college, uh, Carleton, where she got a fabulous education, but she was out there in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota. Um, it's not a super well known college out here on the East Coast, but she's coming back to New York where she's got her personal networks, where my wife and I can sort of help her out and, um, and uh, get, a, get a good boost to her career. As far as my advice on investing specifically, and you can do this from Timbuktu, right? Doesn't, you don't have to do these other things, is most importantly, um, uh, start actually doing it, with a, with a, but with a small amount of money because you're learning and you're gonna make some mistakes. Number two, read like crazy. There's so much information out there. Um, watch all the videos that we're posting on our site. Go back and read all the articles that we've written over the years, um, and then go back and read all the Berkshire uh, annual letters, there is, you could, you could literally spend a lifetime reading what's out there on the internet of good, smart stuff. Um, sign up for some zero, sign up as a guest on Value Investors Club, start reading other smart people's stock pitches. Um, you know, read, just start trafficking in ideas. And anytime you find something that's really interesting to you, start pulling on that thread, start diving in and seeing if you can really develop expertise in a particular area. If you're from a particular uh, country, really learn about the economy of that country and the stocks that trade on that country's exchange. That might be an obvious area where you could have an edge. Um, if, you're, if your family uh, you know, is in a particular business or something, you're, you're basically what you're looking to do is, is develop, get number one, just get on a very steep learning curve. And by the way, that includes reading a major newspaper every day. Don't just focus your learning uh, on, on investing. Uh, you want to be, uh, particularly when you're young, you want to become very well-rounded and well-learned, develop a whole, a whole lattice work as, uh, as Charlie Munger calls it. You know, when you're in college, don't just study econ if that's your major. Um, take classes in history, philosophy, uh, math, and science, uh, but the soft sciences uh, as well. Um, become super well-rounded and just generally develop worldly wisdom but then also look for areas where you're really passionate uh, to specialize in um, and try and become, uh, develop real in-depth knowledge in certain areas, particularly in, in the investing world, because it's the combination of being, uh, always being an incredible learning machine, getting on a steep learning curve, combined with very strong and broad general knowledge, combined with super deep uh, expertise in a few areas uh, that'll really lead to, I think, Lollapalooza effects. Anything you want to add, Glenn? I think that's great. Um, I would, I would just reemphasize: you're young, learn. There's a lot of opportunities to learn. You know, uh, as Whitney said, don't, don't narrow down your learning. Uh, broaden your learning. Um, yeah. Don't. Yeah. That's there's a lot to be gotten. There's a lot to be gotten from things other than investing. Yeah, like I, I look back in, uh, when I was 18 and, you know, I got good grades in high school and I tested well. So I got into Harvard and then I found at Harvard, I sort of found a way to sort of game the system. I'd show up at every class. I'd take good notes. Um, I, I wouldn't really do much of the reading. Uh, and then on the exams, I would regurgitate back to the professors what they had said during their lectures. You know, I, I never skipped a class, but I skipped most of the reading. Um, in other words, I cut every corner. And I just figured out how to game the system, um, and you know, I and it translated into you know graduating with honors and high honors at Harvard and Harvard Business School. But I was not really a learning machine. I was uh, I was sort of lazy, um, and uh, was cutting corners. And I am not proud of that. It is it is an absolute disgrace, in my opinion, uh, that I had the privilege of going to Harvard University. That so many people in the world would give their right arms to have that privilege. And I sort of coasted through and did not take full advantage. Um, I started to fix that problem at Harvard Business School. 
because I was just really passionate about business. Um, and and I, I'd grown up a bit um, and was a little more mature. Um, you know, my mom had to give me a subscription to the New York Times. And I said, Mom, I'm not interested. I don't want to read it. You know, I got better things to do. And she she bought me a subscription anyway. And eventually having the New York Times show up on my doorstep all the way through college, you know, I eventually started to read it. And that's, you know, the, developing the habit of every single day reading at least one, if not the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And now it's so easy. You can just do it on your phone, on your app. Um, you know, becoming a reading machine um, and, and really, uh, you know, diving in and, and, and learning and loving the way you exercise your brain and grow it. Um, you know, it's, uh, I just cringe at, you know, what a lazy corner cutting uh, young guy I was. Um, you know, I've been trying to make up for it ever since. Next question, Glenn. So uh, back to the uh, practical realities, what do you currently think of Netflix? Uh, it's, uh, it's a bad short. Um, and so my first advice is, is to anyone short it, uh, unless you have developed real conviction that, uh, they're really going to blow, uh, their numbers next quarter, like soon, uh, this is a bad short. Um, and even though I got out of the long, you know, a 10 bagger ago, shame on me as one of my most successful investments ever went up five X. Um, uh, you know, this is one that I, sh I should be riding to this day, albeit a two or 3% position. You've got to let your winners run. Um, and I truncated the greatest winner of my career. You know, I nailed the stock of the decade at the bottom, literally the day it bottomed. Uh, I pitched it at the Value Investing Congress uh, and then went on CNBC on national television. And I said, Netflix is going to be this decade's Amazon. And Amazon bet a 20 bagger over the previous decade at the time I said that on October 1st, 2012. So, um, you know, thinking of Netflix and how much money I left on the table. And if I had just held on to that one position, um, uh, I'd still be in business and riding high today. Uh, causes me enormous regret and pain. Um, so, you know, there's such important lessons here where if you really nail something and you really get to know a company and its CEO the way I did, um, and it starts to fire on all cylinders, you got to let that thing run. Now, I'm not saying I, I regret it. You know, had I never sold a share, it'd probably be 80% of my fund today, given it's up uh, 55x from the lows, uh, you know, in October 2012. But um, I definitely should have let this thing become a material position. Uh, and only trimmed it, but kept it a good size position all the way up. Um, so what about it today? Um, it looks pretty darn richly valued by any metric. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, Netflix is a mega long-term winner. Um, you know, once it got a market cap of maybe 150 billion today, um, you know, that's a big market cap, but you know, I think Netflix, I don't think anyone's gonna catch Netflix uh, and they've got an incredible business model uh, so um, I, I would not be buying it with new capital today for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, one way to think about its value today is, is it's probably trading, um, you know, $150 billion market cap, maybe 125 million subscribers off the top of my head. Uh, I, I, I haven't uh, gone through the latest earnings report. You know, it's maybe trading at somewhere between $1,250 and $1,400 or $1,500 per subscriber. But each subscriber, Every incremental subscriber to Netflix is now generating the better part of $150 a year of revenue. And Netflix has virtually no cost associated with every incremental subscriber. To, to just add one more person to the network costs them almost nothing. So if you look at it that way um, and you say maybe it's an 80% uh, pre-tax uh, margin on an incremental subscriber. Uh, so let's say Netflix is generating over $100 of pre-tax income for an incremental sub, um, all of a sudden saying, okay, trading at uh, 1300 bucks a sub, isn't that unreasonable, right? So um, I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a stretch to come up with anything justifying uh, today's valuation, but I don't think it's a good short. It's a terrible short in my opinion. Anything to add, Glenn? It, it, it's funny that you, uh, you frame the question, um, uh, coming out of the box as what what kind of short is it? Because uh, the question was simply, what do you think of Netflix? Um, and I'm guessing the question came from a place of it's down 20% from its high. 
So is it a good opportunity now? Um, but uh, yeah, but I, there are I, a lot of people. I know a lot of people have gotten incinerated, uh, shorting it on the way up. So it could just easily come from somebody um, who's thinking, you know, okay, the growth story's broken, the stock momentum is broken. You know, now is it the time to get in on the short side? Um, yeah, it's it's yeah. growth rate. Um, this quarter was flat with uh, the growth rate last quarter. So it it's certainly I e forty percent year over year growth. Um, you right. cannot be short forty percent revenue growth. Um, for very long at all, unless that growth rate is, unless you're absolutely convinced that growth rate is coming way, way down. Um, and look, it's obviously not going to grow 40% compounded uh, indefinitely. Uh, but even if that growth rate, you know, slowly goes down to the high 30s, mid 30s, 30%, um, the math behind that kind of growth rate is pretty extraordinary. Um, the 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 stuff, um, you know, the fundamentals catch up with the valuation very quickly at high growth rates, something it took me way too long to appreciate. Okay, so um, back to the FANG stocks, um, the, the next FANG stock, I should say. If you had to guess at the CAGR of revenue, of revenue growth uh, for Facebook over the next 10 years, what would your best guess be? Um, do you think the long-term profit margins are closer to 20% or 40%? Um, Right now, Facebook um, is about one third the size of Google in terms of revenues, which in turn is one half the size of Apple. So Facebook is starting from a relatively low base. So I'm, I'm thinking it's roughly a $40 billion revenue run rate, um, uh, which makes me think that it can grow at a fairly high rate, just given it's not starting from a high base. Number two is um, while you know young people in America, like my kids, um, are largely shifting off Facebook, they're shifting to Instagram, which is owned by Facebook. Um, so I don't think Facebook is losing much there. Um, and I think there's huge, huge, huge room for revenue growth here from better monetizing uh, all of their user base outside of uh, North America. Uh, in the United States, Facebook is monetizing uh, about $100 a year of advertising to all of us uh, in North America. And it's only about a third that level in Europe, where, which has roughly the same GDP per capita and advertising per capita, um, and only uh, you know, a tenth that over in Asia, which is obviously across all of Asia, lower income, but not one tenth lower income, and something like one fifteenth that um, in the rest of the world, you know, Africa, Latin America, et cetera. So um, I think it's inevitable that both Facebook and Google are going to be able to charge uh, substantially more for their advertising across the world. Um, I think what's happening in the United States is a leading indicator of where the rest of the world, adjusted for GDP, uh, is going to be going. I can tell you as a small business owner, um, the bang for my buck that I and every other small business owner gets from our digital advertising on Google and Facebook is an incredibly high return on capital and we can track it. Um, you know, um, you're, we're going to, in the very near future, start running ads on Facebook, Google, and LinkedIn for our seminars, our webinars, and uh, we can track how many people see those ads. We can track to the last click how many people click on them and come to our website, and we can track how many people on our website then register for our programs. So I can, almost on a daily basis, uh, I can track to the dollar how much I'm spending and how much revenue for my business that's translating into. Um, that's extraordinary, um, and uh, I, I can't, uh, you know, check back in a few months, and I'll let you know what the numbers look like for my business, but I can tell you across the business world, um, the return on spend on Facebook and Google is, you know, 3x, 4x, 5x, 10x, which tells me that Google and Facebook have pricing power, um, that their, uh, their cost per click and cost per impression um, et cetera, is, uh, is priced well below what the market will bear. So um, all of those things make me super, super bullish on these businesses. Um, and so, so I own both stocks. Um, in terms of Facebook specifically, um, they've been growing. Their year-over-year -year revenue growth was uh, the past few quarters up in the high 40s. Last couple quarters, it's gone down to, I think, 42 and 38% uh, currency adjusted. Um, uh, I think, uh, so, so there are two things that drive the profitability of Facebook. One is revenue multiplied by, uh, the, the margin. Um, and so you're asking the right two questions. My sense is, is that, you know, over the next three to five years, uh, Facebook will grow its revenue, probably 30% a year, uh, which is an exceptionally high rate. 
the company is guided for operating margin to come down from the mid 40s to the mid 30s. My guess is, is that they're sandbagging guidance a little bit there and that it'll probably end up in the high 30s. Um, and just do the math on that, uh, you know, 30 plus percent revenue growth and operating margins that come down a little bit, but are still unbelievably high. Um, you've easily got a doubling of profits in three years under that scenario, in which case the stock is going up. I think the multiple will compress a little bit, but it's already come down, you know, into the high 20s. So let's say it, it tracks down into the, you know, mid 20s uh, or something. I think you've got a stock that's probably up 50 to 80 percent in the next three years. Um, and that's pretty darn satisfactory to me. You know, um, in the last earnings announcement, um, uh, Facebook stock dropped, what was it, 20%, Whitney? Uh, $120 yep. billion. Dollars $110 billion in a day. Of market capitalization. Um, and it was interesting because we had gone through Facebook in our boot camp um, probably a day or two or three earlier than that. Um, and so it, it was um, sort of a real-time experience of, of kind of what's going on. We were We were bullish on Facebook's prospects as a business. And all of a sudden the market gave you a gift um, where ultimately high to low, it dropped somewhere between 20 and 25%. That sort of happens all the time. Um, and yet the, the, the concerns get so amplified when companies um, uh, reduce their guidance um, the way they did. Um, it, it's just remarkable how amplified the, uh, the stock market reaction is. And if you think about Facebook's incentives, their incentives, there's a lot of scrutiny there. Their incentives were to paint a dark picture of their future, and they did. Um, and the market's reaction, in, in my view in this case at least, gives you a little bit of a gift. Um, if you like the stock, you can buy it 20% cheaper than you could the other day. So it's, you know, yeah, it's a clear, very real-time good example. Yeah, Facebook is under a lot of scrutiny right now from governments that are pretty angry about how it's sort of been the Wild West um, Facebook was manipulated, you know, by the Russians in our, for our election hacking, uh, but also um, Facebook has been used to uh, foment genocide in places like Myanmar and Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, so Facebook really needed to send a signal to uh, all the regulators scrutinizing it that we're really serious uh, about reining this in and we're hiring, we're not going to spare any expense and we're going to hire so many people to monitor uh, Facebook and, and so forth. So to some extent, Facebook had some incentive um, to go out there and really tank their guidance. Uh, um, I think it eases off the regulatory pressure a little bit. So um, and, they, and they did that. Yep. Um, but what, what was the result as an investor? If you like Facebook, it traded down to its lowest revenue, earnings, um, and EBITDA multiples uh, ever. So even less, even even lower than it was uh, a quarter ago because the growth uh, popped in. So um, the, uh, uh, the the cheapness of the stock got incredibly magnified um, by by what went on. So yeah, Glenn, we, hold on just a second while we're on that. I'm just going to pop up here um, the uh, uh, our, our slide showing exactly what you just said, which is so this is the uh, PE. Uh, which is the top blue line, enterprise value to EBITDA, which is the red line, and the green line is enterprise value to revenue, price to sales multiple. And you can see that uh, it's been coming down and this does not capture the 20% drop. Uh, this slide, we just haven't updated. Um, so you can see, um, you know, the it's still trading at rich multiples by any metric, uh, but uh, for a business of this, uh, it has, other than maybe Google has the greatest business model in the history of the world, um, still starting from a fairly small revenue base uh, and uh, still has um, the unbelievable opportunity to monetize. Let me just show, uh, let me skip ahead, Glenn, to our favorite slide. Um, I, I, should, uh, I should be pulling this up for Q218. This is Q118. But basically this shows uh, what, what we were talking about before, where in the US and Canada, um, the quarterly monetization is $23.59 in the first quarter, similar in the second quarter. So that's about $100 a year. In Europe, it's about $8, $8 a quarter or $32 a year or two thirds less. Asia Pacific, it's about $10 a year. And the rest of the world, it's about $6 a year. Um, 
this this just is is uh, I'm not sure how much more I, I think there's opportunity to increase monetization in the US and Canada but the real opportunity is is to bring the rest of the world uh, up closer uh, to anywhere closer to where the U.S. and Canada is um, is uh, is going to drive just unbelievable uh, revenue and profit growth for Facebook. So this uh, this slide, by the way, you can just pull up. They they release this slide every quarter as part of their quarterly earnings. This one is the Q1 slide, Q2 slide, uh, which you can just pull up uh, easily yourself. Uh, shows something quite similar. So Glenn, let's move on to. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna just say one more thing about that, which is, um, in, in in the aftermath of the earnings report, it traded down to 21 times next year's earnings. Um, that's the lowest point that it got to, and um, next year being 2019, and the cash build probably gets you up to 30 bucks a share. So um, you know it, it it was probably trading net cash around 18 times earnings um, at its low. And once again, not the cheapest thing in the world, but at a relative market multiple uh, for a company like that, hmm, pretty interesting. So uh, let's see, um, what are the pros and cons of institutional money versus high net worth? Um, when you start your business, you're gonna be going after, you're gonna start with friends and family generally, assuming you're bootstrapping. If you're coming out of a big multi-billion dollar shop with a 10 year track record, uh, and you're building out a whole team. At that point, you're going after institutional money, you know, and raising a few hundred million dollars out of the box. So, but almost all of our students are doing more of the bootstrapping, which is what Glenn and I did over the years. You know, so I started with a million dollars out of my bedroom, built it up to about two hundred million dollars about a dozen years later, uh, before screwing it all up and losing it. Um, I, I closed with about fifty million dollars uh, last uh, uh, end of last September. Um, so um, the way when you're bootstrapping it, um, any business, you're generally starting with your own money and then friends and family. So my first two investors were my parents and my in-laws. Uh, then I went out to a bunch of my Harvard Business School classmates uh, who put some money in. Uh, one, one business school classmate's brother-in-law, another's parents. Um, Bill Ackman's father was my first quarter million dollar investor. And that's how you try and get up to, you know, $10 million. If you, if you don't have a Rolodex that can get you to $10 million under management within, you know, let's say a year, um, you should not start your own business is my general view. Um, you got to wait until, because 10 million is, is, is a critical number, I think. I see so many funds stall out before they get to 10 million. And this is a whole nother digression that isn't really uh, what you asked here. Uh, but, you know, 10 million is the point. It's sort of a, the first credibility number. It's also the first time that a high net worth person might give you a million dollars because people mostly don't want to be more than 10% of your capital, right? Um, it also starts to generate a, a hundred thousand or hundred and fifty thousand dollars of management fee, depending on whether you're one or one and a half percent. And that starts to be able to pay some bills. And by the way, you have a plus 20 year with 10 million dollars. Uh, that's $2 million of profit. You get 20% of that. That's $400,000 you just earned that year plus 100 to 150 on the management fee, you actually could have a viable business if you keep your costs low starting at around 10 million. So you got to get there, not just from individual high net worth investors, that's just your Rolodex, um, which includes hopefully a lot of high net worth people, right? To get to, to get you to 10 million. Uh, then at that point, between from 10 up to at least 50, probably closer to 100, it, it's at that point you're going after high net worth, maybe small family offices, and all, and, and, and then at 100 and up, um, you're starting to go after institutional money. So with that as framing to your direct question, um, um, institutional money has the advantage of that's where the big money is. It has the disadvantage of generally being hot money. Um, it's uh, generally managed by ass covering ninnies um, who, you know, you have a bad quarter and they're afraid if you have another bad quarter, they could lose their job, so they yank the money. Um, institutional money tends to be much less stable much less sticky. And of course, what you want is stable, sticky money. Um, individual investors, people investing their own money. So high net worth and family offices, you know, run by the person whose family, whose money it is. Um, that's the best kind of money to have. Um, you can build personal relationships with those people. Um, and the combination of it being their own money and generally having a long-term time horizon, combined with the ability to build personal relationships, generally results in a much more stable, sticky base of capital, and also just a lot nicer people to deal with in general. 
That said, it's very hard to build a business much above a few hundred million dollars just with individual money. Um, uh, you know, you, at some point, you're probably going to have to pivot over to institutional money. Um, and there, there's just a, you know, a lot more brain damage of dealing with a lot of these ass covering ninnies who are asking you all these nitty questions. The whole sales process uh, tends to be much more elongated. Um, uh, you know, there's not much advantage to institutional money other than there's a lot of money there. Anything to add, Glenn? Um, no, I think that was, uh, that covers it. Um, there's an individual who's a U.S. based, uh, investor who wants to expand to being a globally based investor. Um, what recommendations do you have and what, um, global investors do you admire and which global investors do you admire? Um, I guess the, is the question, someone wants to become a global investor, meaning they want to expand their circle of competence um, and find investors, uh, find investments overseas so that their fund owns stocks uh, that trade all over the world? Or is the question that I run a U.S. domiciled hedge fund and there's a lot of uh, potential investors overseas, do I, for example, should I set up an offshore fund to raise money from offshore investors? Do you have a sense of which of those questions is being asked, Glenn? I believe it's the, the, uh, the first. The first one. So, um, um, so how do you develop expertise in other countries? Um, uh, and this gets back to sort of circle of competence issues and defining you know, what your strategy is and what your edge is. Um, generally speaking, the most important thing you can do as an investor is, uh, is uh, have uh, a circle of competence where it doesn't have to be big, but you got to know the boundaries and never stray outside it uh, or you'll get into trouble. Um, and look, I know people who built successful funds and successful careers doing nothing but invest in small cap, you know, billion dollar and under market cap U.S. bank stocks, long and short or sometimes long only. And that's all they do, right? So if you can really focus in a particular niche, um, you, can, uh, you can do very well if you become the world expert in that niche. The problem is, is that if you can only fish in one pond, sometimes that pond's not very attractive um, and uh, it's just very limiting. Um, and it may also limit your ability to grow your capital base if it's a fairly small pond, right? You're always gonna be small. Um, so, um, generally speaking, the, the broader, the more you can build your circle of competence over time, the more ponds that you can fish in, the better the chances um, that you're going to find some really cheap uh, stock if you can uh, cast a pretty wide net. So that's the tension, though. The wider the net you cast, the more spread out you are, the more difficult it is, is to develop truly deep expertise across a broad range. So uh, my suggestion in terms of uh, becoming a global investor and being willing and able to invest in other countries is, is do so very slowly and carefully um, and recognize, um, you know, look, if you're just talking about your U.S. investor and you might want to go invest in a Canadian stock or two, that's not a very big leap, right? Um, and when you might want to, you know, go over and look in the U.K., uh, but, you know, once you start going out, even into the rest of Europe, certainly down to Brazil, India, China, places like that, um, those last three companies I mentioned are the Wild West. Um, you know, in order, Brazil uh, actually pretty developed. Um, and of those three countries, that's the one I'd sort of most feel comfortable investing in. Uh, you know, then far below that, India, and then quite a bit below that, China. And then way, 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 way below any of those, Russia, which I view as completely uninvestable, for example. Um, but look, look for countries uh, where you can go spend a lot of time over there. Um, uh, when I first started investing in Korea, you know, I bought a little Samsung and a little Hyundai, right? You know, I wasn't uh, messing around with a lot of sort of small cap stocks off the beaten path because look, I don't speak the language, didn't have much expertise there. I thought uh, Samsung, turns out I was right, was the cheapest global big cap blue chip stock in the world. Um, and uh, made some decent money there. Should have made more money there. I sort of sold uh, and got fatigued uh, right before it worked, unfortunately. Hyundai never really has worked, uh, but it's still, if you buy the Hyundai Preferred, it's still trading about three times earnings, last I checked, um, but it's sort of been a value trap. Um, uh, uh, but, but in other words, you know, I went over to Korea, went to a couple conferences, met some management teams, probably learned just enough to be dangerous. Um, it's, you know, my suggestion is, is that you not invest outside your home country 
uh, until you've done a lot of um, background and gotten to know a bunch of people, found, found people that you can trust in that country because um, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble very fast and very easily just be the sucker at the poker table and get blindsided. Anything you want to add, Glenn? No, um, but I do think that the next question is the last one on the queue, um, which is, uh, do you value a company based on management's earnings guidance? How much weight do you put on management's guidance? And how do you use their guidance for your valuations? Yeah, um, management's guidance, which is then reflected in analyst reports, is obviously a starting point. But to make money as an investor, um, you, uh, if, if all you're doing is just taking management's guidance, well, that's what everybody else is using. Um, you, uh, to make money as an investor, all you need to do is um, find a situation where a company overperforms expectations uh, on the long side or underperforms on the short side. In other words, pretty much every stock out there, you know, well over 90% of stocks, it's uh, there are certain expectations about how that company is going to perform in the future. Um, and then, and it's very, usually it's very simple to figure out what those expectations are. You just look at management's guidance and you read the consensus analyst reports. They all tend to cluster right around management's guidance and hence the stock is valued accordingly. Um, so um, that's easy. The hard part is, is figuring out where that guidance is just flat out wrong, where the company uh, is significantly outperforms that guidance, that stock's going to go up um, or underperforms that guidance um, and the profitability of the company crashes, that stock's going down. That's what you want to look for on the short side. Uh, so keep in mind, um, you know, management quality varies dramatically. Sometimes they're just lying to you, trying to uh, keep in mind almost all management teams have incentives to put their best foot forward and uh, to give guidance at the high side of what's likely. Um, try and keep that stock price up. Um, and here's the thing, not, not just because they're liars, uh, um, but because, you know, and not just because most are not liars, uh, they genuinely believe it. You hook them up to a lie detector test um, and they will pass it. They genuinely believe that their company is gonna achieve her Herculean and heroic things. Uh, um, so, uh, so you just have to take it with a huge grain of salt and keep in mind, often it is the company's management team. You would think that they have the best insight into their business because they're the management. They have access to all information about the business, but often they are the last people to see uh, what's happening to them in their business. You know, look, I'll bet the management of Blockbuster, the management of Borders, the management of Circuit City, you know, all these stocks that went to zero due to tectonic changes happening and, and getting Amazon or Netflix, um, that all the way down to the end, they genuinely believed that it was a relatively minor threat um, and that all they, you know, they would wave their managerial wand um, and they would be able to stabilize the situation uh, and that they believed their guidance that, you know, EBITDA was going to go up or turn around or what have you, all the way down to the bottom. So. Um, you know, I have found where I've gotten sucked into value traps and gotten incinerated. It was because I believed management. Um, and in most cases, they were not criminals and liars and deliberately deceiving me. They genuinely believed the crap that they were saying that turned out to be completely wrong. They believed it all the way down. So, you know, look at uh, how many smart value investors got incinerated in Valiant. Um, I believe that Mike Pearson genuinely believed the bullshit he was saying um, and that, you know, Valiant, uh, um, that this was just a temporary hiccup and Philidor was meaningless um, and that uh, the acquisition machine would ramp right up into high gear and they would start jacking up prices again like they always had. I think he genuinely believed it. And that's what's most dangerous, um, where management is so sincere and they so clearly believe and then you think, well, they must know they're the industry experts and they're the ones who can see what's going on inside their business. And you can get sucked in in a terrible way. You have to do your own research and listening to what management has to say can be can, and usually is an important part of that. But generally what you're betting on is, is where management's wrong, either to the upside or the downside. You're betting that the future of the company is very different from what management and the consensus view is. That's the only way you can make money. I just add to that, I'm an easy person to fool, uh, and I recognize that. 
and managements are good at fooling. Um, so I try and put myself in a framework where they don't have the opportunity to fool me. And how do I do that? I like to read transcripts rather than listen to earnings calls. Um, I like to focus on financial filings uh, versus uh, investor presentations. So um, on the other hand, um, Buffett knows how to measure the individual by um, meeting them. And he has that uncanny ability. I would say Whitney's better at understanding people that way um, than I am uh, by far. So you have to understand what your skill set is um, and where you fall into that spectrum and then do your analysis uh, that's, that makes, uh, makes the most sense in that kind of framework. Yeah, Glenn, um, I found one question on the chat here. I've been reading a lot of long recommendations sent around rolling up industries. Indeed, if a company uses its public stock trading at a higher multiple, multiple to buy private companies at a lower multiple, there is an arbitrage. Do you see a trend toward consolidating rolling up industries? Is If so, is there some catalyst that is pushing industries to consolidating now rather than 10 or 20 years ago? You want to take a first stab at that? Well, um, I would say that some of the best uh, short candidates that um, I've ever seen have taken place in industry, industry roll-up situations. And that's because when you're rolling up, you can use accounting to your benefit um, to mask uh, some, some underlying uh, flaws in your business model or in your organic growth. Um, and ultimately, it, the, the story looks terrific until it starts to, um, uh, the, the growth starts to slow and then it, then it kind of unwinds. So I think that in genuine roll-ups um, that are creating true value, um, the roll-up strategy is terrific. Uh, in other words, if a, uh, if a mom and pop operate, a, a great example is Iron Mountain, uh, a storage company. Uh, mom and pop operations uh, would be trading in the marketplace at eight or nine times EBITDA. Um, but if put under a different umbrella, the cost savings in a storage facility are enormous. So it looks like when Iron Mountain was buying things at eight or nine times EBITDA, they're really buying them at three or four times EBITDA. And there are real true synergies. Um, and that's a terrific, terrific strategy. But if you just do the strategy where there's no enormous economies of scale, and instead what you're doing is you're just paying up, you're um, uh, applying a lot of your purchase price to goodwill, and then you amortize uh, that goodwill on a basis that makes it look like the earnings were creative, that's just an accounting game and that unwinds very, very quickly. So that, that's my, my first reaction. Yeah, I mean, by the way, you could say, you know, Berkshire Hathaway itself, I mean, there are some successful examples of companies that have done a lot, a lot of acquisitions. Um, and this is why, you know, we investment managers supposedly uh, get paid the big, big bucks is to be able to distinguish between a, a Valiant and a Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you know, when you see roll-ups uh, with very uh, aggressively managed earnings targets that are using a lot of debt, um, you know, uh, all sorts of warning flags should go up. And usually you can see all sorts of nonsense going on in the financials uh, if you're a sophisticated investor. So, um, uh, so, you know, companies that make other acquisitions, sometimes that can work out amazingly. Look at Google, uh, you know, buying YouTube or uh, Facebook, uh, buying Instagram or whatever. Sometimes these can just be grand slams. Um, Glenn, uh, someone did ask a question here on the chat um, about, you know, what you, please describe what you exclude when looking for investment candidates. And once you have a list, how do you prioritize the order in which you work through the list? And roughly, how do you split your time between research and looking for and thinking about new ideas? Um, I, I guess I'll start with that. I guess there are two questions is, is is number one is sort of prioritizing ideas to look at. And then a second question, which wasn't asked, but I think uh, naturally flows from it, which is, you know, how do you think about the research process um, and what are the things you look for and any tips on that? So um, let's answer both of those. Um, the, first, uh, the first question is, you know, 20 years ago, when I first started in this business, finding a good investment idea was a really important part of the process. Um, you know, it was hard to find good investment ideas. Nothing, there was no internet, you know, for people to post ideas. 
Um, and uh, so developing a network of friends who are out there who would share good ideas to look at, you know, that was an important part of being a successful investor. Uh, today, it's the exact opposite problem. We are all drowning in investment ideas. Just flip open your browser, go to some zero seeking alpha, uh, Value Investors Club, um, you know, so many conferences with people pitching ideas. And these are high quality, well-researched ideas. Um, so having a system to, the most important thing actually is to have a good system to filter and to figure out which ideas of all these good potential sounding ideas, um, uh, figuring out where to focus. And that starts with having a good sense of what your strategy is and where you have an edge. Um, it's, I think it's increasingly hard. Uh, though I am sort of a generalist, I would recommend to most young people here to have a more clearly defined area uh, where you're gonna focus. Uh, ideally, the more off the beaten path, the better. I mean, if you're just out there, just sort of buying a, you know, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Netflix, and okay, maybe throwing in uh, Berkshire Hathaway so you feel like you're a value guy, um, you know, that's not a strategy. You, you have no edge there. Um, so, um, so, you know, it, it's the, the answer about how to process that is, is, is having, being very clear, having a clear strategy and sense of where your edge is, and then very clearly what your circle of competence is. So, you know, you can come across a great sounding idea. You know, the National Bank of Kazakhstan is trading at one tenth of book value and two times earnings right now. Um, it looks really cheap. I'm sort of making this up, but I do remember hearing some pitch for that bank years ago. Um, and just saying, look, I have no edge there. I have no way of knowing whether their balance sheet is any good or not. Uh, I don't have any knowledge of the legal system or, you know, what's, what are the things that can go wrong if you're an outside foreign investor, um, you know, investing in something trading on the Kazakhstan Stock Exchange. So I don't even spend any time there, right? That's an easy one, right? But, you know, it's a lot harder, uh, you know, here in the United States where it's easy to think that you might have an edge in some area. So, um, um, but clearly what you need to do, you need to have a good filtering system or your mind just gets pulled in a million different directions. You get spread too thin. By the way, one way to help discipline yourself is, for example, in my new separately managed accounts business, I am telling investors I will never own more than 10 stocks in your account. Um, you know, Glenn and I back in, uh, in the bad days got spread way, way, way too thin. Our portfolio uh, had a hideous number of stocks in it um, and that polluted our minds and it made it very difficult for us to really focus. So having a, it doesn't mean a one or two stock portfolio, but you know, somewhere between 10 or 15 stocks is probably all you should ever own. Now, granted, you have to follow more stocks than that to find 10 or 15 good ones. Uh, but starting out with a fairly concentrated portfolio, uh, I think, uh, is one important step to, uh, uh, you know, not getting yourself uh, spread way too thin. Anything to add to that part, Glenn, before we move to the second part of the question? No, I don't. Okay, so uh, sort of last question is, is, okay, now you've found an interesting stock to look at. Uh, you know, what are some, some sort of thoughts? And, and, you know, most of this is not rocket science uh, in terms of, um, the approach, uh, I have a four-step process. Number one, I first ask circle of competence issues before I go any further. Once it, uh, I get comfortable with that, then I'm doing a company and industry analysis. Again, no rocket science here, but I'm looking for a company or industry where I think I might have an edge, might know some people, might have some experience, et cetera. Um, and just trying to determine is how good a business is this is on a scale of one to 10. You know, how would I rate the overall business quality and whether I think there are industry headwinds or tailwinds, right? Now, I will buy lower quality businesses at the right price, but generally speaking, you know, I'm looking for businesses of quality seven plus, right? Um, then I'm doing a management analysis and asking three questions. Um, do they operate the business well? Do they allocate capital well? And are they uh, uh, ethical, uh, high integrity and shareholder friendly, right? So now the last question is the most important one, valuation. Because I can find loads of companies that I understand, great business, great industry, great management, but everybody else thinks the same thing about them and it's already baked into the stock price. So then the last critical question is, is what is my variant perception? What do I believe about the future of this company that is different from the consensus view? Because that's fundamentally what you're betting on and that's what's gonna drive the stock. Um, where the business performs 
significantly, not a little differently, but significantly differently than uh, what the market is anticipating. So that's the basic analysis, but some key tips are, is do not fall into the first impression trap. Um, there's one of the behavioral finance uh, traps that we teach is, is that you know, often people come up upon a company and they looked at something like MBIA 10 years ago, um, which turned out to be a fabulous short, but a lot of value guys got drawn in because company had been around for a long time. It was a market leader. Um, it had the highest profit margins in the S&P 500. No joke, it had 50% profit margins um, and was trading for 10 times earnings. And boom, that initial impression was so compelling uh, that it blinded them to doing the, uh, the blinders went up, they bought the stock um, and they didn't even listen to what Bill Ackman was saying um, in great depth and detail and writing, um, you know, laying out that the company was levered 180 to one and had a balance sheet full of bombs, right? That were, that were gonna blow this up and the stock went from 72 to two. Uh, so be very careful that you keep a very open mind as you go through your investing process. Um, and number two, a critical thing is to figure out what matters. Um, because um, there have been lots of studies that show if you give people five key pieces of information or 40 pieces of information, the five key pieces plus 35 additional pieces of information, uh, they will make worse decisions with more information because their brain gets distracted on the other 35 irrelevant things, number one, but two, their level of confidence doubles, right? And that's even more dangerous because you now oversize a bad position, right? So it's really, really, really important to figure out the few variables that matter. So in the case of Facebook that we just uh, talked about recently, uh, figuring out what you think revenue growth is gonna be, and that's a function uh, of new users multiplied by their ability to monetize each user and where we think there's a lot of opportunity for a lot more new users and uh, dramatically increasing, particularly outside of the US and Canada, their monetization of users. So those are the couple key variables on revenue. Then multiplied by their operating margin and just thinking about, okay, what are the costs? They have the world's most perfect business, but what are, are, are the increasing costs associated with that? They're gonna clearly have to hire a lot more people to monitor what's getting posted to end these abuses. Uh, but I think that's likely to be relatively minor. Well, that will then deliver your earnings. Um, and then lastly, what kind of multiple uh, is the market likely to put on these earnings? Wh what's the starting point today? Um, and what kind of multiple for a somewhat slower growth, but still growing, uh, somewhat lower margin, but still astronomically high margin business is going to be three to five years from now and thinking sort of sensibly about that. And those are the only variables that matter. Now, there are a lot of sub variables that play in a role in putting into there. Um, but uh, but that's, um, you know, that's um, it, it, it usually most investments boil down to a couple critical variables and focusing all your time just on those variables and tuning out all the noise that is such just generally in today's world where we are bombarded with noise, bombarded with information. There's always more research and due diligence we can do. Um, that, that recognizing that doing super in-depth work is really important, but figuring out where to focus that super in-depth work um, and when to stop doing super in-depth work and when something is just obvious uh, to act aggressively and in size uh, and stick to your guns and don't get distracted and blow out a position that's really working where you found a great stock just because it went up 50% and miss a 50 bagger, you know? Uh, you know, that's, it's just super important. We're in a world filled with noise. Um, and uh, it's just so easy to have your mind just, uh, you know, fry and, and just blow a gasket because of all the noise out there. So. Um, it's, it's easy to say, very hard to do, um, but thinking about how you structure your day, um, what uh, news sources you use, whether you have the uh, portfolio uh, monitor with the month-to-month -month tickers, not, not month-to-month, -month, excuse me, minute-to-minute -minute ticks of a stock, open or not, um, you know, how often you check your portfolio during the day, who you talk to, uh, and, uh, and what news sources you read, all of those things are super important. Uh, to maintaining a, a, a clear head. Generally speaking, you want an environment that looks like a library 
that's very quiet and distraction free. It's exactly what Buffett does out there in Omaha. Uh, Michael, I see that you're live. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Um, you're muted. Hold on just a sec. You seem to be muting yourself. Let me unmute you. Go ahead. Yeah, my question is about Micron. It seems that the Chinese government is determined to sell Chinese made memory in their own market. Do you think that that sort of busts the Micron thesis, which is sort of centered around less cyclicality and more rational pricing and more complicated uh, chips? Or do you think that maybe the fear is already priced in with a very low multiple in a somewhat oligarchical industry? Yeah, I think um, uh, I, I, I used to own Micron and uh, it was my worst sale ever. I bottom ticked it at $10.50 a share right before it went to 60. Um, and uh, it was it was it was a horrible, horrible, horrible sale, uh, probably my worst ever. Um, so I have been following it a little bit uh, ever since as the stock has just rocketed. My entire investment thesis, which is why I was in the stock, ended up playing out beautifully. The industry consolidated huge demand for the chips. Um, Samsung started behaving rationally and going along with the raising price game. Um, everybody uh, restrained capacity. And so earnings have skyrocketed and the stock has followed. Um, and uh, shame on me for, uh, for uh, you know, letting the market be my guide when instead of my servant. Um, uh, I had circle of competence issues there. It's not clear I ever should have been into the stock. That was my rationalization for blowing it out that I really didn't feel like I had an edge and I probably didn't have an edge, but uh, to the extent I was in it, um, blowing it out on the, literally the bottom tick was the most gutless uh, uh, port and, and dumb portfolio management decision of my career probably. So where are we today? I just read, it was posted on Value Investors Club. I don't know if it's yet within the 30 or 45 day window for guests, but one of the most compelling short theses I've read in a while was short micron here. Uh, because um, uh, primarily because the Chinese are building uh, fabs like crazy. Um, it's a huge uh, source of demand and China has decided for national uh, strategic security interests, et cetera, um, and their desire to build a high tech uh, economy there, um, that they're gonna make a huge push into this area. Uh, they've probably developed or stolen enough technology to do it. Um, and so I think uh, that could really screw up the market. That was one key pillar of the short thesis. Um, another key pillar is just that there's a bunch of capacity coming online. Um, and so the supply demand is about to get back out of whack. Um, now the stock I, you pointed out looks really cheap. Uh, the thing is, is though you have to understand when you're dealing with cyclical industries and cyclical companies, um, they, the stocks are the cheapest when the PE multiple is the highest, i.e. earnings are very depressed or where there's no earnings at all. Um, and the stocks are generally most expensive and about to collapse when the PE multiple is the lowest, i.e. the earnings are at a cyclical peak. Um, so I, I, I don't claim to be the world expert. Don't run out and short Micron just because of what I've just said, but go out and find that short write-up. Um, if you can't get it, email me and I can send it to you privately. Because uh, it's a you know it's a private website, but um, it was uh, it was it was one of the best short uh, cases, uh, best articulated, most compelling with the most near-term catalyst that I've seen in a while. It was so good that you know I sent it around to all of our former students who've taken our seminars, um, you know because I know some of our students are long that stock, and some of our students are looking for good short ideas. So so this one really stood out to me. That's my take on Micron. Anything to add, Glenn? Nope. And we're at 10 o'clock now. All so. right. We're at exactly 10, which is right about when we were ending. And uh, believe it or not, I think we got through every question that came came through on the chat. Um, there are a few questions that came through via email um, that uh, that we didn't get to. Uh, but it was uh, great. Uh, Glenn and I really enjoyed this. Um, we really appreciate all of you joining us for our, our first experiment with Q&A with Whitney and Glenn. Um, we're going to um, we will make this video available um, and post it on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can go, just go to YouTube, type in case learning. It'll take you there, subscribe to it. We're gonna start, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna post this whole two hour video there for anyone who missed it. But also um, we're gonna chop this up into every question and start uh, putting out uh, little shorter videos so that people who don't, want, don't have the time to watch a whole two hour thing but just are interested in one particular question. 
um, they'll be able to easily go through and find, you know, what we had to say on Micron, what we had to say on Facebook, uh, you know, what we had to say about doing research uh, on a stock, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, to make it a little more manageable for folks. Um, uh, so uh, keep your eyes subscribed to our YouTube channel, subscribe to it, and we're going to start posting a lot of interesting stuff on a much more regular basis um, on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So uh, uh, go and favorite uh, both uh, the Whitney Tilson accounts as well as the Case Learning accounts over there uh, to keep following us. And uh, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, you can uh, email wtilson at caselearning.com with any follow-up questions, uh, uh, me personally. Um, as well as go to caselearning.com uh, and uh, where you can check out our programs, our upcoming webinar uh, that we're going to teach over 15 days, um, all three of our programs over 15 two and a half hour um, uh, sessions from 7 to 9.30 every morning Eastern time, uh, starting on uh, September 4th, uh, going through September 15th, um, excuse me, September 21st, uh, 15 sessions. Um, and then uh, we're going to do our in-person, uh, all three programs, Monday through Friday, September 24th to 28th. Uh, then we're going to Hong Kong, middle of October, uh, Sydney, Australia, end of November, early December, as well as teaching again in New York. Uh, so uh, we've got our short selling conference uh, coming up on December 3rd, Monday, December 3rd, uh, at the New York Athletic Club. So we've got a very busy agenda the rest of the year. Uh, look forward to meeting you in person, I hope, at uh, one or more of these events. And again, uh, thanks for logging in this morning. Hopefully talk to you soon. Take care.